And now what you've all been waiting for, we are pleased to have as our keynote speaker today, popular Washington Post columnist John Kelly. As I'm sure you know, he writes the Metro section column called John Kelly's Washington, Monday through Friday, to taking a look at Washington's less famous side. If you read the October Beacon cover story about him, you know that John started out at the Washington Post writing freelance articles while he worked in his first post-college job as an editorial assistant at an association based in Washington. In 1989, when a temporary position as deputy editor in the Post's weekend section opened up, his editor offered him the job. Well, that supposedly temporary position has led to him being with the Post for 33 years and counting. Uh, first, he rose to editor of the weekend section, a position he held for a decade. Then in 1999, he went on to create the Kids Post page, a very popular uh, element on the Post, which is still going strong. From there, he went on to become a general assignment reporter in the Metro section until he began his daily column in 2004 after Bob Levy, who had been writing the column for the prior 23 years, retired from the Post. So something I learned from our article, which was written by Margaret, our uh, executive, uh, managing editor, uh, is that having a daily homespun column at the Post began 75 years ago in 1947, and John is only the third person to be its author. That's an incredible history and staying power for a newspaper column, and it puts John in the pantheon of columnists, I think you'll agree. John is a native of Washington, D.C., born in 1962 at Providence Hospital. Being the son of a U.S. Air Force pilot, he grew up in various places, but he returned to the area and graduated from Rockville High School and the University of Maryland. He has held two journalism fellowships at Harvard in 1998 and Oxford University in 2007. He and his wife, Ruth, have two grown daughters and a dog who, he says, refuses to grow up. In his spare time, John plays drums in a band called the Airport 77s. I'm sure you'll hear more about that from him. I really enjoyed my conversations with John, and he spoke last week at our expo in Northern Virginia. It was very well received, and I'm sure he will be here as well. Please join me in welcoming John Keller. Thank you. Can you hear me? Stuart gets to hear this all over again. So. <laughs> Let me know if I get anything wrong. Um, this is very convenient for me because I live not far from here and actually have been here several times. And I know it's called a senior center, but the only other times I've been here were for my daughters um, who are not seniors. But once was for a preschool graduation, their Montessori school, and the other was multiple Brownie and Girl Scout events. My wife was a troop leader, so I know this. Uh, I know this place. Even so, I was almost late because the parking lot is so full. I had to drive around looking for a parking place. That's exactly what you want. It's lots of old people fighting for parking spaces on a Sunday afternoon. But, and I was one of them. So, Stuart, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, a long time ago, probably 16 or 17 years ago, the phone rang in my office and I just happened to be there to answer it. It was much more common back then for me to be in my office uh, every day because this was before the pandemic. Now I go in once or twice a week. I didn't go in for a full year after the pandemic started. After a year, I went in to get my mail, which had piled up. Um, now I pretty much work from home. But uh, on this day, anyway, I was in the office. The phone rang. And when I answered it, I had not been writing the column for that long. I'd only been writing it for a year or two. Now, with five columns a week, that's a lot of columns. That's, a hun you know, that's hundreds of columns. But I really didn't know then what I know now about the pace of writing a column and, and, and how to do it. But uh, you know, the people who wrote the column before me, as Stuart said, Bob Levy. Bob Levy wrote it for 23 years. Uh, and the guy who wrote the column before him, who started the column, Bill Gold, wrote it for 34 years. And Bill Gold started in 1947, and I love the way the column started. At, at the time, Bill was an editor at the Post, and he noticed that the back of the A section in the op-ed, there was just little poetry and doggerel and little scraps of information. And he said to the editors, why don't, you, why don't we take this space and let me write a daily local human interest column? And they said, go right ahead. Uh, so it started that January. And back then, not all newspaper stories had bylines. 
If you look at really old newspapers, it'll just have the story. It won't say who it's written by. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And when that column started in January of 1947, it was called the District Line, which was the name under Bill Gold. And it started out and it said the District Line by W.E.G. Those were Bill's initials, William Epsant Gold. And from the start, the column was very popular. It was a daily collection of what someone called good humor and bad puns. <laughs> and it had just little things, neighborhood goings on, school and club events, birthday greetings, cat and dog giveaways. Bill would say someone has a kitten, they're putting up for adoption. People loved the column so much that after a couple of weeks, the editor said to Bill, Bill, this is so popular, why don't you put your name on it? So about two weeks after the column started, it changed from the district line by W.E.G. to the district line by Bill Gold. And almost immediately, some readers started to complain. <laughs> they sent in letters that said, the column was so much better when it was written by W.E.G. It's really gone downhill since this guy Bill Gold took over. I'm not sure what we should learn from that. I feel like we should learn something, but I don't know what it is. So, uh, I'm waiting for the phone to ring in my office. Well, not waiting for the phone to ring on this particular day. Journalists do spend a lot of time waiting for the phone to ring or waiting for someone to answer our email. So I urge you, if a journalist ever calls you, please don't think, oh, I'll call them tonight. I'll call them next week. They're probably busy right now. They're busy waiting for you to call them back um, so they can get to their story. Uh, you know, journalists can seem pushy calling you at home. But that's because it's our job to gather as much information as quickly as we can and think about it and organize it and, and give it back to readers. And you don't want all the readers calling you. It's better just one journalist calls you, you call them back and they, they distribute it. Anyway, the phone rings and it's, I will, I will say it was an elderly woman, an old woman. That's what I would say. Now back then I was, you know, 20 years younger than I am now. so. I was too young even for AARP, and, but I know that that word elderly bothers some people. And in August, just this last August, I wrote about a column, a column about a man in Anne Arundel County named Bill Collins. And Bill is a psychologist, so he has an office constantly seeing patients. And when the coronavirus pandemic hit, he had to stop having people in his office. He had to stop having patients. So to fill the time, he started painting, and painting, and painting. He painted hundreds of paintings, all abstract acrylic works on canvas. Uh, eventually, Bill rented space in Annapolis. His wife was getting tired of tripping over the paintings all over their house. And he opened a gallery to sell nothing but his paintings. Bill is 84 years old. And when I interviewed him, he said, don't call me elderly. Don't call me an old man. I don't feel like an old man. I don't feel elderly. So I didn't. I just wrote how old he was, 84. I did use the headline, a portrait of the artist as an older man, to play off the James Joyce novel. Uh, what I think Bill was saying was, you're only as old as you feel, and he didn't feel old, and he didn't act old. Which brings us to that phone call. I can't remember what exactly the woman was calling me about. She'd read something in one of my columns that she wanted to comment on, which is very common. I depend on readers to give me ideas. She'd read something, she had an opinion or an idea that she wanted to convey, but she was having trouble getting the point across, and she was embarrassed about it. I'm sorry, she said. I've never been old before. <laughs> and that phrase has stuck with me ever since. I've never been old before. None of us have. None of us in this room has ever been older than we are right now, at this instant. And now we're even older. <laughs> older still. 
It makes me miss the good old days, back two or three minutes ago. <laughs> Remember the good old days? Everybody agrees they're over, right? When exactly did they end, anyway? I once tried to figure out exactly when it was when the good old days turned into the mediocre current days. I thought maybe it was when toothbrush manufacturers started making their toothbrushes too fat to fit in those little holes <laughs> on your, those, you know, in my bathroom, I live in a house that was built around 1940, in our bathroom, for our bedroom, uh, it's a typical, you know, the white and black tile, and it has sticking out a little ceramic thing, and it has a little ledge with a, you can sit the, uh, a cup in it, I guess. And, uh, and then it's got four little holes and you can fit the toothbrush in. Except you can't fit the toothbrush in unless you go out of your way to get a special toothbrush or you whittle down the toothbrushes they make now because they're too fat to fit in there. And I'm, I'm sure that manufacturers say they're more ergonomic. You know, that it's easier on your hands to hold them. But I think they just want to charge you more for the toothbrushes they sell. So I thought, Maybe things started to go downhill when toothbrush handles got too big to fit in the toothbrush holder holes. Or maybe the good old days ended when auto manufacturers got rid of vent windows on cars. Do you remember those? They were these triangular windows at the front and they were perfect for just a little bit of air in so they could defog the windshield. Uh, if you didn't have air conditioning, which was much more common back then, they did cool down. And at some point, they got rid of those. Now you just have a big piece of glass that goes up and down. It's much harder to adjust the uh, temperature. So maybe that's when things started to go downhill, when they got rid of those triangular vent windows. So I asked readers to nominate the instant when things started to go downhill and the good old days ended. And I heard all sorts of things. One guy suggested, it's when Band-Aid got rid of the little red thread to open the Band-Aid and replaced it with the sticky thing at the top. Remember you said to do a Band-Aid, you had to find it like, do it like this? I heard, those always frightened me personally. I thought I was gonna, you know, garrot my fingertip or something. But uh, that's what he said. Somebody else said, um, when Jimmy Carter signed the Airline Deregulation Act. That was very specific. Do, do we want to give some chairs to the people at the back? Do you? Is there someone who? Is, or there? Yeah. Or just come in and take a chair. Or you guys can sit here. You shouldn't have to stand. Uh, a guy named James Ratzenberger of Vienna, Virginia, said the decline of civilization can positively be dated from 1971 when McDonald's began its You Deserve a Break Today advertisements, which issued in the age of entitlement that we are suffering through. Suddenly, everybody thought they deserved a break. Every day. You deserve a break today. You get your break today, you wait. Tomorrow, you get another one. John Hughes of Woodbine, Maryland said, things started to go downhill at the demise of the full-service gas station. Self-service gas pumping spawned the devil of the current environment, where the customer does most of the work, he wrote. Next thing you know, when you go to a restaurant, you'll have to cook and serve your own meal, <laughs> wash the dishes, and pay an additional fee to process your own payment. Of course, that's what we do at the grocery store, right? We do our own, which I kind of like, actually. Uh, while we're thinking about gas stations, and automo automobiles. Philip Whitehorn of Bethesda, he believes the good old days ended when automatic transmissions started replacing manual gearboxes in cars. He wrote, when one had to shift gears and use the clutch, there was no time for other activities. <laughs> with the automatic transmission, people now sit in a very comfortable seat with hands-off telephone conversations, multimedia entertainment systems, and distracting computer screens. I saw, I saw something on Twitter. I, I never know if I, if I see something on Twitter if it's true. It probably isn't, but I saw a little photo it was of a valet parking, you know, in front of a restaurant, valet parking, valet park here. And it was a valet parking stand, and it said, no manual transmissions. 
So the valet parking guides couldn't drive a <coughs> stick shift car. You couldn't leave your car there. Uh, a guy from Washington named John Faslau, he believed that our national decline began with allowing motorists to turn right on red. <laughs> he wrote, this morphed into a disregard for all traffic rules, which then spelled, spilled over to disrespect for other rules of daily life, as well as civility. And one thing I do know where I saw it, which was in the Washington Post, is that Washington is going to start having no turn on red on most of its intersections. I'm old enough to remember when you pretty much couldn't turn right on red in Washington. Then they started bringing it back, except for a few places, including around where the old Washington Post was, um, 15th Street, L Street, M Street, 14th Street. That was an anti-prostitution measure, the no right on red there. Actually, what they had was no right turn at all. They didn't want people just sort of you know, going around the block. Um, but now no right on red is coming back. And it's funny, if you, if you live long enough, everything comes back. Uh, you know, I see some of the clothes my daughters wear, and it's like, the girls I knew in high school were wearing those clothes. And they were ugly then, and now you think they're cool. Um, of course, when you're young, um, we're talking about old people, so. When you're young, you either don't think about old people at all, or you think that they've always been old. You think that being old is their job, or their nationality. You expect them to know about being old the same way a plumber knows about clogged pipes, or a person from England knows about fish and chips. What you don't think is that the same way you had to learn to crawl, then to walk, then to run, so these people had to learn how to deal with getting older. And for a lot of us, getting older means doing those things in reverse, learning how to go from running to walking and maybe even back to crawling. What you don't tend to realize or accept when you're young is that old people were once young too. And this reminds me of a story my father told me not long ago. My father is 83. And uh, he, he was born in Washington and grew up in Washington, like uh, Stuart mentioned. Uh, and so was his mother, my grandmother, Momsey. And her family, uh, and thus my family, goes back six generations uh, in the district. Back to Colonel Jehiel Brooks. Brooks was my great, great, great grandfather and the neighborhood in Northeast Washington where my parents grew up, Brookland, is named after Brooks. Although the land actually came from his wife, Brooks' wife. She was the one who had all the uh, land. Uh, Queen was her name. Um, anyway, that's where my parents grew up, near Catholic University. My mother was on 12th Street, Northeast. My father was on Otis Street, Northeast. My mother was a Spillane. My father a Kelly. My mother was one of eight children. My father was one of uh, a comparatively paltry four, although he lost his oldest brother, Frank. When uh, Frank was in the Air Force, he was a navigator, and in 1957 or 58, during a, crane, a training flight, his bomber crashed in, in Texas, and he was killed. And you can understand why my grandmother was horrified after losing her firstborn son. Uh, when her second-born son, my father, said he was joining the Air Force to become a pilot right after his brother had died. And that's what he did. Six weeks after I was born at Providence Hospital in Brooklyn, as Stuart mentioned, I went with my mother to join my father in Japan, where he was stationed, 1962. He flew uh, a plane called the B-50 reconnaissance plane, which was a modified B-29 bomber that flew into typhoons but also along the border with China to sniff, to see whether the Chinese were testing nuclear weapons. And my brother Chris, my younger brother, was born in Japan. And as Air Force brats, we lived all over the world. Arizona, Texas, Idaho, Japan, England, Germany. Uh, after my parents divorced, I moved to Maryland to live with my mother. And my parents both married again. They both live in North Carolina for some reason. And my brother lives there, too. Um, 
So back to the story my father told me, but that's what we were talking about. Around 1971, my father flew an airplane uh, to the Andrews Air Show at Andrews Air Force Base. <coughs> it was a brand new RF-4C Phantom, the type of plane that he flew in Vietnam. And on this particular day, it was his job to stand near the airplane and answer questions from people who came to the air show. And a bus came up and stopped a short distance away, and the door opened, and out came a few dozen Air Force veterans. These weren't necessarily old men, but they were older men than my father. They served in the Air Force in World War II, and before then, back when it was the US Army Air Corps, before there was a separate Air Force. Some of them were a little slow, a little stooped, my father answered their questions about the airplane, a plane so different from what they'd flown in World War II. Then he watched as they walked back to the bus. As they did, one veteran turned back to my father and said, I know what you're thinking, Captain Kelly. You're thinking, look at those old farts. <laughs> well, let me tell you, you're going to be just like us one day. <laughs> you know, you're going to be an old Air Force veteran who's going to go up to a young guy and say, well, I, used to, I flew in the war. And I, this is what I flew. Um, and that's exactly what he is now. He's, he's older than those guys were. And I'm probably the same age as some of those guys were. I, I will turn 60 next month. I'm 59 for a few more weeks. Um, I love old people, actually. And that's why I'm so sad that we seem to be running out of them. Have you noticed that? There are fewer and fewer old people. Do you see any old people in this room? <laughs> no. You see a bunch of people about your age. I worry about that sometimes. Because I, I love old people and I, I love the insights they've gained from a lifetime of experiences. I enjoy talking with them and learning from them. But people my age, what do they know? Some of my best friends are people my age. But let me just tell you, I don't find them especially insightful. When they talk about what life was like when they were growing up, it sounds awfully familiar to me. <laughs> Boring, even. So I will miss the older generation when I become the older generation. Of course, our concept of aging has changed. Just like that painter I told you about, Bill Collins, who didn't want me to call him elderly. We've changed the way we talk about aging. We don't like to say old or elderly, so we say senior. Sometimes we don't even say senior. The beacon used to be the senior beacon, and it's just the beacon now. I've even heard the word better, like a retirement community that advertises it is for ages 50 or better. That took me a while to figure that one out. But old habits die hard. I still say National Airport and Cabin John Bridge. Of course, the older generation seems to get younger every day. In 1984, AARP dropped its membership age from 55 to 50. In February, Britain's Guardian newspaper reported on a survey of 500 people aged over 60. And it found that most of the respondents felt about 12 years younger than their actual age. So I was an English major, so the math is not easy for me. But what that means is if you were 70, what you felt was 70 minus 12, which I wrote this down last time, which is 58. Is that right? <laughs> 70 minus 58. OK, so I would feel 48 when I turn 60. Okay. Uh, and they were also asked when old age begins. At what age does old age begin? And the average answer was 76. That's what they said. In England, anyway. Um, but think about it. No one who turns 76 has ever been 76 before. Uh, the Beacon, formerly the Senior Beacon, was kind enough to put me on the cover of... Uh, the most recent issue, 
with a nice story by Margaret Foster and a headline uh, that read, More Than Half His Life at the Post. And I have to say, that did make me feel old. <laughs> and it almost seems like it was describing a prison sentence. <laughs> you know, you hear about people you know, wrongly accused and convicted and incarcerated. He spent more than half his life in prison. Well, I've spent more than half my life at the Washington Post, and it's a very comfortable jail cell. When I started there in 1989, I was 26 years old. It's a lot of math today, I apologize. I was so young that I was on a committee of newsroom staffers under 30 who were charged with figuring out ways to interest young people in the newspaper. Even then, our readers were old. I mean, we could see that people who read newspapers, and this is before the internet and the web and WashingtonPost.com, um, but we could see that our readership was getting older. So we needed to attract younger readers to feed them into the pipeline of readers. Uh, eventually, Kids Post was going to be one of those things. So I, I started that in, in the year 2000. Um, I could not be on a committee for young readers or young people now. I'm not a young person. Um, and I remember thinking, as we met and we looked at the data about our, our readership getting old, that maybe rather than changing the newspaper to attract younger readers, we should invest in life-extending technologies just to keep our readers alive longer. <laughs> you know, get them at this end, not at this end. But um, obviously that's very expensive. You know, I, uh, there was one thing I left out of when things started to go downhill, and it's my column tomorrow. Not that tomorrow is when things start going downhill, but it's about how one other thing I was uh, missed, like the vent windows and other things, and this is an example, this is a shirt without a pocket here, which I really don't wear that often. I try not to wear it all. This is a shirt I bought specifically for my daughter's engagement party. And so I didn't really need it, but, but when I didn't need a pocket, but when I'm working, I mean, a pen is very important to me, and I need a pocket, and shirts, men's shirts, really don't come with pockets anymore, dress shirts. In fact, you read the column tomorrow, you'll see it. There's some fashion expert that says, you know, the vast majority of men don't use shirt pockets, and so they shouldn't have one. And I'm like, well, you know what? Most people don't use seatbelts either, but when you need one, you're glad it's there. And that's how I feel about a shirt pocket here, because a pen is such an integral part of my job. Um, anyway, we're talking about the Post. I used to be young, I'm not anymore. There are lots of young people at the Post, and we are doing interesting things to attract younger readers. I have no idea what those things are. Uh, we have, I have a lot of very young colleagues. I don't know what they do. They do things with TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter. And it's very important. I'm glad they're doing it. it it's not meant to appeal to me. That is one of the things, actually, is that you have to kind of accept as you get old, which is not everything is for you. And you don't have to understand it. That's been a great uh, weight off my back, that there's things I, I don't have to understand new things, necessarily. Um, so, I feel like I'm allowed to feel old, in that regard, socially or culturally. I mean, I can't be, I shouldn't be too dismissive. I mean, it's hard for me not to, you know, get off my lawn occasionally, like tomorrow's column about pockets. Um, but we should be allowed to feel old or elderly, or senior, or better. Um, because there's no denying that things do change, uh, especially when it comes to the human body. I, uh, you know, they say your body is a temple, but if you live long enough, it will become a temple of doom. <laughs> its walls cracking, its foundations settling, its floors splitting open to reveal pools of boiling lava. I went, I, I had a heart attack when I was 38, and so that was 20, 21 years ago, and I, I, um, I you know, so I have a cardiologist, and he's great, and I, I go to see the cardiologist, and in his office, there is a heart, 
not an actual heart. That would be cool, but it's like a plastic heart that opens up. And there's a poster with a split open heart, and you know, here's ventricle and all that stuff on it. And it worries me that it's there to remind him how the heart works. <laughs> I want him to have memorized that. Does he have to go in every time to his little room and, and look at the poster? Um, but just last week, I'm probably oversharing, but uh, I mean, I'm 60 years old practically. I went to a urologist. His office does not have a poster of the heart. And it does not have a plastic model of the heart. It does have a poster, and it does have a model. It's something else. Um, I used to hate hearing old people complain about their various aches and pains. But now that I am one, with my own aches and pains, I can't get enough of it. I want to hear details about how others are decaying and share my dilapidation with them. My hands alone are worthy of a TED Talk. How did the skin, which used to be so taut and, and uh, dewy, unlined, go to something resembling a dry lake bed or the skin on a sharp, sharp hay? You know, those wrinkly dogs. How did my hands become my father's hands? The human body is endlessly entertaining. You don't pay a lot of attention to it when you're young, you take it for granted, but then you reach middle age, late middle age, which I guess, depending on guardian readers, is what I'm in. Um, and your body becomes as interesting as a prestige TV series, with as many plot twists as Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. I wake up every morning thinking, I wonder what's going to happen next in this show. What little bit is going to hurt? What thing is going to sprout hair when it doesn't make sense? It's never had hair before, now it does. Um, but back to what that woman told me on the phone. I'm sorry, she said. I've never been old before. I love that phrase. And I, I shared it with a guy named Steve Forbert. Steve Forbert is a singer-songwriter. He was kind of popular in the late 70s and early 1980s. He had a song called Romeo's Tune that was kind of a minor hit. Um, that's not the song. Um, for about 10 years, I've been using a, a line from a, a different Steve Forbert song as my email signature. So you know at the bottom of your email, you can put your contact details and you might put something that tells a little bit about you, your personality. So, uh, I heard a song of his that I'd never heard before, maybe 10 years ago, and a line just jumped out at me. And the line is, it's often said that life is strange, oh yes, but compared to what? <laughs> and this, the line comes from a song called January 2330, 1978 about a trip that Steve Forbert took back to Mississippi, he's from Mississippi, after moving to New York City to try to make it big as a musician. He was one of these guys who was called the New Dylan, which is always a bad thing to be called, because it's a compliment, but it kind of ruins you after that. But I love that line. It's often said that life is strange, oh yes, but compared to what? Because it conveys a perspective that's always in my mind. Life, living, seems like something we ought to know how to do, but we really uh, don't know how to do it. We're all making it up as we go along. So I've been using that line for years, so I've been sending it in thousands of emails around the world, and I decided, you know what, everybody's stuck at home. I'm going to call Steve Forbert and ask, do you mind that I'm using this line? Do you want me to stop? using your line. I mean, I do credit him. I say it's by Steve Forbert. So I called him, and he was very nice. He was lovely. And he, he said he didn't mind me using it at all. Using it at all. And then I told him about this other line that really stuck with me, that a reader said, I'm sorry, I've never been old before. And he said, I can relate to her line. I like it a lot. And it, it reminded him of a phrase 
that he once read in a book by the English poet Alfred Noyes, who remarked upon our, <clears throat> excuse me, our insensibility to the utterly inscrutable mystery that anything should be in existence at all. And it also reminded Steve Forbert of a Lily Tomlin quote. Lily Tomlin said, reality is nothing more than a collective hunch. <laughs> I asked Steve Forbert if it was weird to be 64 years old and singing a song that he wrote when he was 24 years old. And he said it wasn't. He said, it's not detached from me at all, even though it's about a kid going home. That was 40 years ago. I can still sing it, and it works, and it's always got that line at the end. He'll always be that kid, and he'll always be every person he became after being that kid. Growing old, I've decided, means adding things. I know what that woman who called me meant. I stumble to remember names or words. I wake up with a sore back sometimes. I worry about my cholesterol. I've never been old before. But I had to get older to have the experiences that make up my life. Meeting my wife, watching our children grow, learning about myself, what I like, what I don't like, developing the confidence to say yes to new things, and the wisdom to say no the things I don't want to do, the interesting places I've visited, the people I've met. In a way, they've all been the good old days. I hope there are plenty more good old days to come for me and the people I love and for you and the people you love. May we all grow old together for the first time. Thank you. from people who have uh, questions or observations or comments. Um, as I said, my, my column doesn't work unless people contribute to it. So if you have questions about it or the post or anything else, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I just have a comment. I uh, went to a doctor's appointment many years ago, and I was told that I had to go to the whole application, you know, you have to go through this whole business. And he's typing in his computer, and all of a sudden he says to me, and how old are you? <laughs> and my father, look, I'm saying to myself, you can't take this So I said, mentally or physically? Mm. <laughs> Just typing, typing, typing. Stops, looks up and says, I'll look it up. Well, look at that. And hopefully he knows math. He could give me a birthday, he can figure it out. I have another word for old. It's chronologically experienced. No. Oh, chronologically experienced. Okay, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sir. Hi, thank you, John. We've met before in the barbershop. Oh, yeah. Okay. You July. You interviewed me for a column, and I appreciate the, your, your humor and everything. I, I know the Steve Forbert songs very well. I can play them. And I, I was watching the Romeo's two YouTube video, an old one, and a newer one, and I thought, my God, he sure has age. He sure has <laughs> And he can't quite get the... I don't know what he'd say about you, but... Uh, yeah, well, I can't either. But, uh, and I saw Paul McCartney recently, and he hasn't got it like he used to have. But my question is about, uh, I noticed not only your column, but the other columnists and some of the reporters, you're not putting your email addresses at the end of your columns anymore. Is there a reason for that? There is, and it's annoying, and I wrote a column about it, um, in fact. <laughs> but the, you don't have to read them all. There's five of them. My mother and my wife are the only ones that read every one of them. Um, so yes, we used to have in the paper at the end the, the reporter's email address, which I liked, because it reminded me who wrote the story. If I jumped, you know, I didn't have to go back to the where it started to see who wrote it. Now, what I was told, and it makes sense to me because I've worked at the Post for a long time. So we have a newspaper, which is, you know, we have to typeset. I mean, typesetting now is not metal type the way it used to be. It's, you know, it's like a photograph that is scanned and everything. So 
When a reporter writes something, it has to work what we call our content management system, our CMS. That has to work to put things in the newspaper on the printing press, and it has to work to put it on our website, WashingtonPost.com. And a newspaper has um, a lot of requirements that like a word processing program doesn't. We need to see many versions of a story. Who added something? Did an editor insert an error? Um, it has to be very robust. Now we have to be able to drop photographs in for the web and all the search terms and all this. So what I was told was we got a new content management system and it no longer had the ability to automatically put the email address at the bottom of the story because every time the story was edited or a new version was made, you'd have to put it back there again. Which sounds ridiculous. I mean, we can yeah. put a man on the moon. We used to be able to be able to put a man on the moon. Um, and we can't do that. But having worked at the Post for 33 years, I can see that. You know, just the way large corporations don't think and probably don't care because what they're concerned about is how can we make it look good on the web we don't care about in the newspaper. Um, that's, that's what I think. Now, online, you click on any reporter's byline, and it basically will say, do you want to send an email? So, you know, I hope that the newspaper, and I think the newspaper will be around for you know, years to come, but the attention showered on it will not be the same as the attention showered on the website. We will be making the website more interesting, better to look at, better to search, more features, and the newspaper, I fear, will become, you know, it will lose things like um, by, uh, email addresses and beautiful layouts. Maybe, you know, we won't have as many other questions. Not a question, but a comment about the good old days. Phone booths yeah. <laughs> and teaching cursive. Teaching cursive, phone booths and teaching cursive, yeah. They don't do that anymore. I have very bad handwriting. Um, I had a remedial handwriting class at fourth grade that didn't keep. Um, but uh, yeah, I gather that they think that, that you know, Historians in the future will not be able to read the handwriting of people now. I do know that when I look at a lot of old newspapers, because uh, I like history and I write about history, and it takes a while to learn anything. How do you read an 1870s newspaper? When you've looked at enough of them, you kind of know how they're organized. And I hope that handwriting will be the same way. That is, future generations will know, okay, I sort of get cursive and therefore um, when I need to read something, I can figure it out. But uh, I guess people today take notes, you know, on their phones. Yeah, like speaking of phones, when I got my good phone, I asked if they had one for the rotary. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. If they only teach printing, how do you sign your name? How do the kids learn to sign their names? That's right. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll go back to an X. You know? You see that document. E sign. E sign. I did sign some documents. Actually, speaking about filling out forms for a doctor to go to the doctor, it was the most complete. You know, when you go to a new doctor, and even when you go to your regular doctor, they're always having you look at forms again. It's like I filled out the form last time. And a new doctor is worse, but this doctor, it was all online, and I thought it was going to be a pain in the butt. It actually was great, because when I got there, I didn't have to, all I had to do was, you know, confirm my identity. Um, my mother told me many years ago, I was probably 10 or 12 years old, you need to learn how to type. Everybody needs to know how to type. So that was because you had to have these office skills, but who knew that you'd be doing this so many years later? So. You had some insight before any of us. Yeah, we do need to type. Did you have another question? I'm sorry. Did I see a hand over here? No. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Please send me ideas when I ask for things.
Thank you very much, John. For those of you who uh, didn't hear him last week, I have to tell you, it's better the second time. I mean, it's just, 